striding down a trail at the foot of Pike's Peak with single-minded determination. One solid fact clings iron in your mind. Nothing on this mountain will stop you from victory. But be that as it may, even the most determined hikers need refreshment. So you take a fork in the road down to the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside is a raucous competition of ideas on the arts, faith, and whether the three-point line ruined the game of basketball. At a corner <laughs> table by the fire are three people. One of them keeps insisting that Space Jam is the greatest sports movie ever made. And that's me, your co-host Matt Milima, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the front range of Colorado dedicated to one very simple goal, a renaissance of the Christian imagination. To further this goal, we do all sorts of things. Each spring, COVID permitting, we have our big Imagination Redeemed Conference, which attracts folks from all across the country. We have our next one scheduled, COVID permitting, for this upcoming April 2021, so keep a lookout for that. We also, COVID permitting, have a regular slate of concerts, lectures, and other events designed to foster love and understanding of arts and faith. And we, when we can't do them in person, we often try to stream them online as well. And we have our own Guild of Artists right here in Colorado Springs. And when we aren't creating art, some of us like to podcast. Therefore, believe to see. To find out more about Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're there, you should check out Anselm's two other podcasts, Redeemed Imagination and Speaking with Joy. And since you're already doing stuff, why don't you go ahead and rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. That would help us a ton, increase the visibility of the show, yada, 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 you know the rest. Just, just go ahead and do it, all right? Just don't, don't think too much about it. Just do it. Now, on to the topic for today. And I don't know if any of you listeners are aware of this, but, uh, you know, things haven't been quite the same this summer. Uh, a lot of us have been trapped inside more than off, more than we usually are, had our routines disrupted in very serious ways. And some of us in, uh, less serious ways as well. One of my routines that got interrupted a lot, I know, woe is me, is that <laughs> I usually enjoy watching sports around this time. I am a big fan of the Denver Nuggets, an NBA team, and they were really good this year. Number three seed in the West. Our center, Nikola Jokic, was about to be first team all NBA for the second year in a row. I thought we had a real chance to be dark horse contenders for the title. Then season gets you know, suspended for a long time. They're trying to bring it back. Nikola Jokic got diagnosed with COVID in Serbia. Yep. <laughs> and for a while, we had just no sports for a long time. But then dropping from the sky was this documentary, <laughs> The Last Dance, about Michael Jordan and the 1998 Chicago Bulls. Let me give you all a little bit of background in case any of you, are, you all are like, ew, sports ball. I don't want to do that. Hang with me. I think there's a lot of value here. So The Last Dance, like I said, is a documentary about the season of the 1998 Chicago Bulls. That is the season they won their sixth and final championship, and it was Michael Jordan's last season with the Bulls. So this is the greatest team of the 90s, one of the greatest teams ever to play in any team sport. Certainly one of the most culturally relevant and impactful teams to ever play in any team sport. And Michael Jordan is the most famous, important athlete maybe ever, uh, certainly since like Muhammad Ali and Babe Ruth. And going into that season, for reasons I'm still not clear on, Michael Jordan gave permission for a camera crew to follow him around throughout the entire season. So you get a bunch of back scene stuff with Michael Jordan and his coach and all the eclectic cast of characters on there. And you get an insight into Michael Jordan, who, even if you know nothing about sports, you know Michael Jordan because he's Michael Jordan. <laughs> so because this sat there in this time when none of us had actual sports to watch, it had this gargantuan impact on the popular culture, popular sports culture in particular, and it really ignited a lot of debates that have lain dormant for a while. It got us thinking about a lot of stuff that I think is relevant, even if you're not a sports fan, about narrative and its impact on how we view things, generational differences between older generations and younger generations, and a whole bunch of other stuff I want to get to. So I think that we can use The Last Dance and Michael Jordan as a lens to view society and the art world writ large. I think writ large is one of those senses I'm required to use as a podcast host. Uh, but anyway, to do this, I brought a couple special guests onto the show. 
One of them is Mandy, who you all know. Mandy, say hello to everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, Mandy, I was just telling you off air that when I asked you to be on this podcast, I was like, oh, I think she, like, I know her husband likes sports. I think she likes sports enough. Maybe she's familiar with this, but you were already on this. You, you saw that. Oh, definitely. Yes. Okay. Basketball is my favorite sport. Obviously, I'm 5'4". I never played. I didn't play any sports, really. But it, when I say favorite sport, I mean to observe to go to the games, to cheer on. That's my favorite. So, All right. Do, do you have a team? Yep. Um, oh, well, the last dance kind of rubs some salt in the wound because my team for a long time, for no explicable reason, because I'm from Georgia, not Florida, but I loved the Orlando Magic. It was actually because I really liked Penny Hardaway. He just captured my imagination like when he was drafted. And I just started liking the Orlando Magic. It made no sense. Um, and then all, you know, that. Sad stuff happened because they weren't good enough. <laughs> well, they were almost good enough, and they they, they were the almost good in the enough. Mid-90s that, a couple years. That makes it worse that they were almost good enough. <laughs> because do you? I sorry, my husband would be laughing right now because he knows exactly what I'm going to say. I'm going to say Nick Anderson. If he had known how to throw free throws, then they would have beaten the Rockets in the national championship. I can't remember what year ninety. Four? Five? It was nine, I can't 95. Remember. I'm five, a big Orlando okay. Magic fan as well, so I've been trying to sit here and keep my mouth shut, and I, I just got no, to have to say something that. here. You're, uh, yes. you're, 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 no, you're rubbing some salt in my old wounds, too, what here. So. Right? You'd find two Magic fans for this. This is amazing. That is yeah. amazing. Yeah, my husband actually, for one Mother's Day, got me a subscription to the Orlando Magic magazine, <laughs> and all of my friends were like, oh, that, like, they thought it was like a faux pas, like getting me a vacuum. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I was obsessed. I have not forgiven them for firing Doc, though. I'm not over it. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. But That was dumb. Well, there we go. I had no idea you had all these pent up feelings about the Orlando magic. This is, this is I really did. It feels good to exciting vent. information. And it's actually yeah. really exciting for the other. So for our guest at the table this week, Luke Moja. So, Luke, me and him have been friends forever. I think we met when we were in middle school, and we grew up watching sports together, and we grew up talking about Michael Jordan together. So, of course, I had to have him on for this show. And also, we, we always planned to have our own radio show one day, Matt and <laughs> I figured this podcast yeah. is as close as we can get to a radio show nowadays. So, Luke, tell us about yourself, what you do, and your sporting interests. If you want to just commiserate with Mandy about the magic, you can do that, too. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I uh, am currently a student at Palmer College of Chiropractic in Port Orange, Florida. So yeah, I'm a big Orlando Magic fan because my dad's family is from Central Florida. So yeah, those, awesome. those mid-90s Magic teams with Shaq and Penny Hardaway and all those, those were my, uh, I was a yes. huge fan of those teams as well. So uh, he definitely brought back some memories with that one. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> No, so some good memories and some bad ones. So, yeah. you know, uh, not, not all bad, but right. um, yeah. And so, yeah, I've known Matt for about 20 years, I guess. And, uh, you know, we've always had conversations about sports and everything. And uh, so I uh, appreciate you bringing me on the show. Oh, absolutely. The mode. Um, so <laughs> a couple things. I think you're on. the only person who's ever called me that. So. <laughs> I just had now you're just going to make him proud. He's just proud of that. <laughs> yeah, I read that as an insult. Like, all right, I was the only one to think of it. But one point, really quick on the magic. Do you remember Penny Hardaway, star for the magic? I'm telling the listeners this because you guys are painfully aware. He yeah. has a career that is <laughs> tragically marred by injuries. He has to retire soon. The the magic breakup. It's very tragic. But he had uh, this line. Yes of advertisements called the Little Penny ad campaign where they had a marionette of Penny Hardaway who's a little penny and then they sold a yes. marionette doll. Do you remember Little Penny? I had forgotten. Thank you for reminding me. I totally well, remember Little Penny. My brother, Jeremy, Luke, this will not surprise you in the slightest, he loved Little Penny and he wanted, yep. to, he wanted to buy a Little Penny marionette doll of his very own. And marionette oh. dolls are creepy. And they, yes, marionette dolls mm -hmm. scared me because I, I saw like this horror film about, you know, marionette dolls coming to life and killing you. So when he was really into Little Penny, I remember being terrified at night, picturing Little Penny coming in to murder me. <laughs> so that's, we all have painful memories around the magic. Mm. They're just different kinds. Um, yeah. Yeah. That, that whole thing doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> <laughs> so. 
let's get back to The Last Dance. And this takes us back to 1998. I know, Luke, I have very, very vivid memories of this playoffs because me and you were friends at that time. So we, we mm-hmm. actually watched some of the games together. Yep. And just talk about what you remember from The Last Dance and what you remember about Michael Jordan and Carl Malone, John Stockton, Reggie Miller, mm-hmm. and all these great basketball players. Well, yeah, I'll, uh, you know, kind of start out with, you know, Michael Jordan. You know, I was a sports fan from a young age. And, uh, so, you know, some of my earliest sports memories were watching Michael Jordan and those early 90s Bulls teams. At that time, you know, I loved, you know, those first three championship Bulls teams and, you know, loved Michael Jordan and all that. But, you know, after he came back from retirement and they won the second three championships, that's when those Magic teams, you know, were good. And mm-hmm. uh, so the Bulls were kind of their rivals in the Eastern Conference at that point. They would always meet in the playoffs. It seemed like the Bulls would always win. So. I was, uh, you know, not a huge fan of those last three Bulls championship teams. You know, even though I still liked and respected Michael Jordan, um, we'll say I couldn't really stand those teams. Um, it might be a uh, better way to put it. I've, uh, <laughs> I've, I've never been a huge fan of the uh, bandwagon teams that uh, win a lot, yeah. have a lot of bandwagon fans. And those last three Bulls championship teams were definitely those kind of bandwagon, culturally popular teams. And uh, just kind of make it worse, they would constantly beat my team in the playoffs. Yeah. So, you know, I was <laughs> always pulling against those teams. And, you know, I remember the Pacers almost got them in the Eastern Conference Finals in 98. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I thought the Jazz would have a chance in the finals that year. And, you know, it just, you know, they just couldn't pull it off. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of that mystique and legend of Michael Jordan is the fact that he went 6-0 and in the finals and nobody ever even got into a game seven. So, yeah. Oh, and that mystique is something we will get to, Luke. Believe me. I have <laughs> I'm sure we will. Uh, Mandy, what are you doing yeah. as the Bulls are doing the second three-peat and, and everything's going crazy? Oh, well, that, yeah, that was hard. And especially because my mom was a very vocal Bulls fan, which was, purely because of Michael Jordan, you know, she's, my mom's kind of a hoot and she always, she likes the long legged athletes. And so she'd I mean, be like, Michael Jordan's a very handsome man. I mean, I can't, he is. And so, you know, my mother, the cougar, no, I'm kidding, but she, she loved Michael Jordan and, and it irritated me. Just like you said, Luke, I cannot stand bandwagon teams. We actually lived mm-hmm. in Southern California during the, really dominant Pat Riley Lakers Mm -hmm. stuff. And, oh, it was so (laughs) annoying because all my friends who didn't even like sports had, like, Laker flags on their car. So it was a very – it was a difficult time for me, honestly, because I really loved the Magic. I couldn't explain why. And then they're getting beaten by this team that my mom adores for no reason she could explain other than bandwagon and – you know, but look how pretty when he runs down the court. It's so pretty. That would be <laughs> what like she would say. She can explain, Mandy. I mean, hey, I'm tra- support me here. <laughs> anyway, it was hard. It was hard because you just I don't know. I remember um, this was the first team that I ever the magic was the first team I ever liked for my own reason, not because of geography or because my daddy liked them or my husband liked them. And my, I cried so hard the night that Nick Anderson missed all those free throws. And I told Peter, I don't like being a fan. That's my husband, Peter. I was like, I don't like being a fan. It hurt. I don't like it. So yeah, that was hard. And you couldn't say that Michael Jordan wasn't miraculous because he was. And that just made it that much more frustrating because he was undeniably yeah. amazing. Yeah. If you could. Get on your soapbox, be like, he's overrated. And these that, that might give you something to say, but it's not, oh, uh, no, he's just great. And that sucks. Yeah, like LeBron. I can go off on LeBron, but you know. <laughs> oh, man. Preview of things to come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so. I'll, I'll give sort of my background. Um, so me, me and Luke are about the same age. So we'll, we kind of hit the same point here. I will say, I remember, I have a vivid memory of when Michael Jordan retired the first time. Again, Ooh. listeners, some of you who don't love sports ball, he, Michael Jordan, around 92 or 93, he retires out of the blue, goes to play baseball for a couple years, and he comes back and wins three more championships and, you know, completes the hero's journey. But when he yeah. retired for the first time, it took the world by 
absolute shock. I was sitting in my first grade class and one of the dads for another one of the kids in the class comes in and says, well, guys, big news. Do you know what famous player has uh, decided to quit the game forever? And he said, Michael Jordan, and it blew my little six-year-old brain out of my head because I was just so shocked by this. So <laughs> as a six-year-old, I knew, oh, Michael Jordan's the greatest ever. He's, yeah. which is weird that we got in that cultural moment when he, Michael Jordan's like 29 at the time. And we all just knew as a fact, like, oh, Michael Jordan's the greatest ever. It's not Magic Johnson. It's not Larry Bird. It's not Bill Russell. It's not Kareem. He somehow ended the debate, more or less, by that time, which is crazy. But then, well, the, all those guys you just mentioned said he was the greatest ever. Which is, I weird, mean, Magic right? said that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> people don't say that about people now. No. But then we, we go along. <laughs> I, Luke, I was right with you. I was cheering against the Bulls because. I didn't like bandwagon fans. We all knew bandwagon fans, and I, I was yeah. not one of them. I loved and respected Michael Jordan, and it, I admired his greatness. I sincerely meant what I said about Space Jam being the greatest sports film ever. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's so that, we don't want to go down that rabbit hole. So yeah, <laughs> rabbit hole, Bugs Bunny, Segway. You did it oh wow! Meaning to. Oh that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't even realize but, I did that. That was so, wow. He, he films Space Jam. In between, like when he's retired, so right before he comes back to win his second three titles, and the whole premise of it is, oh my gosh, Michael Jordan's the coolest, isn't he? And the movie works off of that premise. That's all they're going on. It's like, yeah. isn't Michael Jordan cool? And like little eight-year-old Matt's like, yeah, he's the coolest. So that's, <laughs> that's what I want to get to now, is this idea of myth-making. So one of the things that The Last Dance really drove home was this mythos around Michael Jordan. Like, there's a lot of debates about whether the greatest player of all time is Jordan or LeBron. Sounds like Mandy has some thoughts we can get to later. But <laughs> one thing is very clear. Regardless of who is better at playing the game of basketball, the mythos of Jordan is unsurpassed by anyone, you know, this side of Muhammad Ali. So... Let's talk a little bit about the mythos of Jordan, how he's sort of this legendary figure in people's minds. Mandy, yeah, what was the mythos as you understood it, and did it change over time? Are we talking just about him or about the documentary? Mostly about him through the documentary lens, but mo mostly okay. about him. Because the I think okay. the documentary is a lot about the mythos of Jordan. Well, as you know, thank you for reminding me how old I am. I was married around the time that Michael Jordan, <laughs> and I was not six. I was not a child bride. <laughs> so <laughs> I remember my dad being excited about Michael Jordan, um, just even getting drafted. And there was just this, uh, just a wonder kind of surrounding him. And I think they mentioned this in the documentary, which I don't think I really realized, but it seems like he really was the first big, big individual star that like they stopped saying, Oh, the bulls are playing. It was Michael Jordan's playing. Obviously they already had magic and bird and other people like that, but they still with bird, they talked about the Celtics. And am I right in saying, I think they said that in the last dance that he really was the beginning of the sort of the central figure of teams to the extent that it is today. Cause now like if you see a commercial, it'll be like LeBron versus whomever, not the team names anymore. Don't you think? Oh, I, I definitely think so. I mean, okay. like, like you said, Just, magic and bird yeah. sort of owned the eighties, but not to the extent that Jordan became like the NBA. Do, do you agree with that? Luke? Right. Yeah. I would, I would certainly agree with that. I mean, he, Jordan, I feel like was for the first kind of real like cultural icon um, yeah. as a, you know, as a basketball player. So I think that kind of played a part in that too. Yeah. And I think people that weren't even really into the sport. So I, I guess maybe, I don't know if it's to the extent that Tiger rejuvenated golf because there were fans of basketball, but it brought in people were interested in how good he was and people enjoyed watching him play, even if they weren't typical basketball watchers like my mother. So. I just remember sort of following it from the sidelines because I think when he was new to the NBA, I was still in like college, late high school and college. But then when I got married, I married a sports 
fanatic. There has to be sports on all the time. We were actually watching Cornhole a couple weeks ago. It was hilarious. <laughs> but anyway, there has to be sports on. So I would watch it with him, whereas I didn't really sit down and watch basketball with my parents, but I knew who Michael Jordan was. So it really, when I started watching it, was really that 90s era of his first and second stint with the Bulls. And like I said, it just, it was irritating since he wasn't on a team. He was on the team that kept beating my team. Um, But you could not look away when he was playing. And then, of course, there's the flu game, which is ridiculous, which apparently was really food poisoning. But yeah, I mean, yeah, there's definitely like could do a whole three hour podcast just on that. But let's put a pin (laughs) in that for now. (laughs) Yeah, I just I feel like he almost he achieved legend status before he was even halfway through his career. It seems like to me, that's all I got for him. Yeah, I no, I I, <laughs> I agree with all that. You know, Luke, uh, tell us, give your idea of like the mythos of Jordan and how you view him through like a kid's eyes. You know, when he's in the prime of his career, and then like later on when he's with uh, like the '98 Bulls. How would an American sports fan kid view Jordan back in those days? Yeah, I mean, I think the first part of it was the fact that he was just a ridiculously good basketball player. I mean, without being that good, you're not going to achieve that kind of legend status. And I think, you know, also, like we mentioned, you know, the fact that he was such a you know cultural icon, you know, the endorsements and the marketing and all that. And, you know, Space Jam later and everything. It was like, you know, the whole thing was just about how cool Michael Jordan was, you know, and I remember watching like Michael Jordan highlight videos on VHS and stuff like that, which makes me sound really old, but, um, you know, I'm sure it probably won't be the last time I sound really old on this podcast, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like just the marketing behind that. And then I think a lot of that, you know, that mythos that you're talking about, it's funny that you brought up the hero's journey earlier. Cause I was thinking that like, you know, he got to the top one, three straight championships and then just walked away at the top of this game. You know, went and played baseball for a year and a half and then came back and won three more championships in a row. I think you know, that kind of storyline, that, you know, narrative like that was really what kind of sealed that legend, kind of that myth or whatever. Because, you know, a lot of athletes don't have that kind of comeback story like that. And the fact that he was able to come back and win three in a row again, I think that was really kind of what, you know, solidified that legend and that myth that you see kind of today. Yeah, so a couple thoughts along that point. Uh, first of all, going back to the last dance. So the last dance opens when the Bulls are doing like a preseason, you know, like goodwill tournament in in Paris. So they they basically go, they play a couple French teams, they kick the French teams' butts, and you know they go home before the season starts. <laughs> and it was just mind boggling how much the Parisians loved Michael Jordan. I mean, in, in basketball, we think of it now in 2020, it's a pretty international sport, but it was just only beginning to catch its feet internationally in the 1990s. And the way Michael Jordan was just walking around, he would get mobbed by crazy French fans wherever he went. He was treated like he's, you know, like Thor or Hercules descended from, <laughs> from Mount Olympus. It was just mind boggling how yeah. much all these people on the other side of the world loved Michael Jordan. It seemed like he was like synonymous with all that was most aspirational about America. You know, American pop culture was Michael Jordan. That's like how we as Americans wanted to present ourselves to the world. So that was like how it was in 1998. When you look at like 1991, 92, as Jordan's winning his first three championships and really solidifying himself at that young age as the greatest, he had this image that was just squeaky clean. Which is so mm-hmm. weird to think about because, you know, as Mandy's mom is very aware of, he's extremely <laughs> handsome, which I, I brought that up to my wife as we were watching The Last Dance. It's like, you don't really talk about it very much, but Michael Jordan's really good looking, like, like network TV good looking. And you don't talk about it because he's so, he's Jordan. He's his own entity. You know, you, you don't talk about Thor right. being good looking because he's, he's a Norse god, but Michael Jordan is oh, like that. I don't know. I, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I'll, I will go to bat for Thor, Mandy. Um, but that's oh yeah. Topic. Oh no, I meant I was saying he is good looking, and I think people talk about it. Oh, that was what okay. I was saying. I was maybe I maybe like in circles that didn't come up as often. <laughs> I would hope. 
Yeah. No, my daughter, my daughters and I were discussing I, it. So I, I do, re- <laughs> I do remember one time during a fantasy football draft, Matt making a comment about Tom Brady being handsome, but that's about Blech. all I got for you. On that. No, I stand sorry, by I that a horrible comment. sound. Tom Brady <laughs> does a lot of things, but uh, he's. <laughs> I mean, I'll, I just call him as I see him, Luke. Tom Brady's a handsome man, not Michael Jordan handsome, but he's up there. But he's like this perfect pitch man for this time when like American monoculture is, you know, reaching this, this sort of apex where he's the best basketball player in the world. He's cool. He's a good right. pitch man. He has this squeaky clean image for some reason. And he's just like perfect. He, he's in a way that a lot of like transcended race, transcended class. He was like this monoculture figure. And uh, like the documentary also hits on this when it came out like 92, 93, like Michael Jordan, like he gambled a lot. He went to Vegas a lot. He he didn't do anything that was like illegal or even like immoral technically. They they weren't actual scandals, but they he's still like, ooh, he gambles and he's a jerk to his teammates sometimes. That was enough to shatter the narrative. Do you remember that going right. on, Andy? Yes, I do, I do. And I, I was going back a little bit to the international fame, I I would bet that that has a lot to do with the fact that ninety two was the first Olympics that allowed pro basketball yep. players mm-hmm. instead of just amateurs. So, I mean, that was handy for him <laughs> to be part of the dream team. Oh, the but, dream um, team. Mandy, I love the yeah. dream team so much. I'm not, I'm going to stop talking about the dream team because I want you to answer that question I gave you first. But okay. We will get more back <laughs> to the dream team. I think he would have been legendary anyway, but I mean, that just added because, you know, I can't remember where that Olympics was held. But anyway, but that that put the spotlight where the whole world was now watching him if they hadn't been yet. But no, I do remember I remembered it vaguely and then having watched the last dance, um, when they brought up that they started thinking that he had lost that one game because he had been gambling the night before or something. And I remember my mom was very disappointed. We should just have had my mom on here. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> you have your my mom, mom on was podcast. so disappointed. <laughs> yeah, because she was railing about like, oh, shame on him. Why did he do that? And whatever, you know. So, um, but no, I do remember that. I remember the whiff of scandal, which, you know, pales in comparison to the types of things we see today. But yeah, it was like- enough to get make him a little dusty i would say it's really amazing because like again these aren't like crimes of moral turpitude you know he he gambled and he <laughs> like he stayed up late gambling and he was a jerk to his teammates like but that yeah. was enough like that shows how much of a pedestal we held him on where that was enough to knock him off and that's just mind-boggling right yeah so we, we can kind of okay, open I'll, this up can i chime I'll in on ahead, that Luke. just real quick sorry yeah, about go that for it. i was just gonna say what really struck me in the documentary was when Michael Jordan was saying when they were interviewing him, he was saying, you know, if I could do it all over again, I wouldn't want to be in the spotlight or be considered a role model because, you know, everyone's going to do whatever they can to knock you off that pedestal and tear you down. And you know, that really kind of, you know, struck me, you know, when he said that and like kind of what we're talking about. And uh, I remember reading, there's a biography about Michael Jordan that came out several years ago. I remember reading it. And uh, I think when the media kind of turned against him like that, I think, you know, he really kind of felt betrayed and, you know, almost became bitter after that. I think he kind of kept to himself a lot more after that. And, um, you know, just felt like, you know, they were kind of trying to tear him down maybe unfairly. And, uh, you know, I think it just kind of brings up, you know, how difficult it is to live, live that kind of life in the spotlight all the time and how people are constantly trying to tear you down for whatever and dig up any kind of dirt they can. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. That that was also clear in the documentary. It's like during the season, Michael Jordan couldn't go anywhere. Like they had the camera right. crew. He was just in his hotel room, like watching TV. And he'd explain he can't go anywhere because w- the moment he stepped out of a hotel, he'd be mobbed by just throngs of adoring fans. And that's one of those things where it sounds like yeah. a dream, but you could see like he literally is trapped in his hotel. He is so famous and successful he can't do anything i think it's like the gilded cage metaphor is is what we should say there but (laughs) yeah so this whole myth making is sort of a double-edged sword where at the one hand he's he's literally a billionaire now he's the first athlete to become a billionaire he's world famous everyone you know loves him or at least you know before he got knocked off the pedestal which (laughs) all that is to the good he's 
He was firmly set as the greatest basketball player of all time, maybe the greatest athlete of all time, you know, before by the time he retired. But with that comes its own thing. Like you said, Luke, he did seem to be getting bitter. He's only hanging out with his security guards. And that was really shocking. It's like, you're the yeah. most, you may be the most famous person in the world. There's literally a song saying, if I could be like Mike, and the right. only people you can hang out with are your security guards. That's that's almost sad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, it's, I almost, he's a. I'm, it's. A, I'm sorry. He just, he's just. He's a myth, but then he's not a myth. That's mm-hmm. like he's a myth to us, but in reality, he wasn't. He was a real, actual person. So, yeah. Go ahead, Luke. Sorry. I was going to say it almost made me feel bad for him, like having to live that life where you constantly have to be on like that, constantly being mobbed by everyone. And somebody is always demanding your attention. And then you have to go out and uh, perform as the greatest basketball player in the world. I mean, I, that just, you know, seems exhausting to me. I was like, I, and maybe they almost made him kind of the sympathetic figure in my mind. It's like, it, no one would really want to live that kind of life. Right. Yeah, And there's also this other part to the Jordan mythos that developed later where, like you said, Luke, the, the pressure to perform all the time, where he had this attitude, you know, that it's sort of a famous thing that he said, where every game he goes into it knowing that there's somebody out there in the stands who this is the only time in their lives they're going to see him play. So he wants to put on a show right. so it's something that's memorable. And when you look at it, I mean, that's what he did. He played every game hard. Even that sort of throwaway game before the season started against that little team from Paris, he played hard in that game because <laughs> he yeah. had the Parisians there. That was their only chance to see Michael Jordan play. Like he'd play, you know, against when the Bulls were winning, the Nuggets were the worst team in the league. But he would come into Denver <laughs> and he'd be awesome because he's Michael Jordan. Mm-hmm. That's what he does every night. And that's expected of him. Whereas now it's it's expected that if you're an NBA player and you're smart, you don't play all out every game because the science has caught up with it. And we know that if you do that, you're going to run out of gas in the playoffs. And the thing that really matters mm-hmm. is the playoffs. So if LeBron James are coming into town and he's like, ah, I just, I need to take a load management break. That's something that is accepted. We're all of us fans would be like, yes, you are smart. Yay. And <laughs> we just know that going in, like LeBron either isn't going to play or maybe he'll just sort of hold back on defense because he's saving for the finals. And again, that's probably the smart thing to do. But Jordan didn't do that because people didn't do things like that back then. So he got worn out. Right. And then also just this maniacal competitiveness. That's one of the things that came through. It's this idea, and again, this is firmly implanted in the Jordan mythos, that Jordan was the most maniacal competitor who ever lived, where he would get on the court. And I heard someone talk on a podcast, like, you use the words you use for serial killers. Like, he didn't just want to beat you. He wanted to destroy you. He wanted to cut your head off and throw you in the East River or something like that. And this idea that he wanted to destroy all comers around him and he would stop at nothing until he achieved complete and total annihilation of all who stood in his way. It, it, that they kept. Including <laughs> his teammates. Talk, yeah, we can talk about if, this, like these slights that yeah. he imagined other players <laughs> giving him. Yeah. Can you talk about what was his favorite imagined slight that he gave in the documentary? Oh, uh, there were so many. And it was like, the yeah, one that, that he funny. made, the one that he actually made up, like they, they were talking about, I think it was Michael Wilbon or somebody who was talking about, yeah, he asked him about it later. He's like, yeah, that didn't happen. I made that up. It was like, he, he would make up slights if he couldn't think of anything. It was just anything he could find to motivate him and, you know, to just want right. to, you know, yeah, it's <laughs> that, that, yeah, that I really got a kick out of that. And just, you got a sense of that mentality because he was always saying, you know, win at all costs was what he kept saying. And it was like, yep, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, but my favorite was when he was in the the finals against the Seattle Supersonics in like 1996. So this is like one of the greatest teams ever Michael Jordan's on. He's in the NBA Finals, and the coach of the Sonics is this guy, George Carl, who I like. He was a Nuggets coach for a while. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was a Nuggets players, coach, too. Avoid Michael Jordan. Don't talk to him. Don't communicate with him, because he'll just use it and use it as his little motivation to get his psychopathic edge on us. So then yeah, it's his George fuel. Carl, Happens to be dining, exactly. He happens to be dining in the same restaurant as Michael Jordan. Following his own advice, George Carl doesn't acknowledge Jordan. He just ignores him. Jordan uses the fact that George Carl ignored him <laughs> as fuel. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Because being in the NBA finals isn't fuel enough. He needs the slight, like, oh, 
the other team's yeah. coach snubbed me in the, in the dining room. So that was his feel. Yeah. Like, are you literally insane? But that, that again, is part of the <laughs> Jordan mythos. Yeah. And so something along those lines I wanted to talk about is his legacy in sports and in culture. Am I being too much of a worry ward here? But I wonder if that's a negative thing, this sort of win at all cost mentality, where it's like, I feel like it's ingrained into like the soccer coach dad across the country. It's like, you need to be like Michael Jordan. If you want to be great, you have to rip out your opponent's heart and show it to him before he dies. Do you think, think that's had any negative effects? Like, like Luke, you've grown up in this, a lot of the same situations as me. Do you feel like Michael Jordan yeah. had some negative impacts on, on just the sports culture? Probably. I don't know if it was just Michael Jordan, but I think, yeah, that mentality, that whole win at all costs thing. And I think some of the things that made Michael Jordan such a great basketball player were kind of his flaws as a human being, I guess you could say, you know, the fact that he, he constantly rode his teammates and he had that kind of win at all cost mentality. And you can see him on the documentary. He's like, he didn't understand that other people, you know, weren't as crazy competitive as he was. It just, mm -hmm. you know, that didn't register to him. So it was kind of like he had to push everyone to, you know, get to that point. And, you know, I mean, he, to some degree, I mean, I think it worked. I mean, it, it made his team better. I mean, you even heard his teammates say, yeah, sure, he was a jerk in practice, but it made us better players. So, I mean, you could, you look at it from that angle, but, you know, is it always, you know, the best way to treat other human beings? You know, I think you could make the argument that, you know, it probably wasn't. And, you know, that may have had some had some you know negative impact on the culture. Yeah. Mandy, do you see something similar with uh, the, the Jordan tendency in, in sports or just like in culture? Yeah. And it was interesting to me that to him, I think because it worked, he sees no problem with it. I didn't see any regret at all, if I recall correctly, in the last dance. I don't, um, because to him, he's like, but that's what I wanted was to win. That's what my team wanted was to win. That's what the fans wanted was to win. The people who watched me wanted me to win, unless you were a Magic fan. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yeah. whatever. But <laughs> so to him, I don't think he sees it as a cost, or if he does, he sees it as a cost that was worth paying it seemed like that's how it came across to me anyway i mean you could contrast him <laughs> with dennis rodman who certainly didn't want to win at all costs and when you think about how much better of a player he could have been if he had a little bit of michael jordan's um drive i don't know it's an interesting thing to think about as far as where do you draw the line or should you he's i mean he has or no, I guess he did get divorced. I was thinking that he had a like nice, happy, like long term marriage or whatever, but I don't know how it's impacted him in his personal life. But I mean, I, I did read that Scottie Pippen was and Horace Grant were not happy with the last dance documentary. So I, I don't know if Michael Jordan really thinks of it as a loss that he alienated people. It's hard to tell. It's really interesting because I feel like. I was doing this. I'm sure a lot of people watching were doing it where you're, you're trying to like psychoanalyze Jordan as he's giving, you know, these hours of interviews for the last dance. And it's, mm -hmm. again, it's hard, it's hard not to view him as like a character in a Shakespeare play. You know, it's like you could write doctoral dissertations about Hamlet's inability to take action and Michael Jordan's inability to stop being a jerk to his teammates. And the way <laughs> thing that came out to me was Jordan genuinely seemed to feel that he couldn't help it. He had such a all consuming maniacal drive to win or, you know, his version of winning that he couldn't right. help but ride his teammates into the ground, you know, kick really good teammates off the team because they didn't quote, didn't care as much as he did to burn bridges with, you know, like, like you said, Mandy, the two best mm -hmm. players that he ever played with were probably Scotty Pippen and Horace Grant. He mm -hmm. basically burned bridges with both of them for not really fair reasons. And that's right. just such. I feel like that is sort of the other side of the coin where we talk about his drive for greatness. That may be one of the things that made him great, but it also may be his, okay, I'll use archetypes again. It may be his tragic flaw <laughs> as well. Because, uh, mm. I, so there's a GM for the Rockets now, Daryl Morey. Luke, I'm sure you have a lot of opinions on Morey because he's, he's one of the guys yeah. who's most into like <laughs> analytics and 
new statistics. He's on the cutting edge. He's like part of the nerd revolution. We nerds have <laughs> taken over the NBA. Yeah. He has a lot of research that suggests that the best environment for winning is an environment that's more positive. You know, like the old school coach were like, would yell at you if you make a mistake. Like that's actually harmful for you if you want to win. Better to have a more positive environment. Again, science. So maybe the fact that Jordan could win six NBA titles while writing his teammates, maybe they won despite Jordan doing that, not because of that. But it's, it's mm. interesting that the narrative is, and this is definitely in the culture, that if you want to win, you need to be like Jordan. He won because he did that. Well, maybe not, if we're looking at, at it more objectively. But that is definitely the narrative, and I think that's just fascinating. And it's weird so to go back to the Rodman thing is weird to me because he seemed to give Rodman such a pass just because there was nobody else who could block like Rodman, right? Or get the defensive rebounds, right? So yes. I don't know. It, it's odd to me that of all the people he seemed to go easy on, it was Rodman. So that, that's, that's odd. That's a really me. fascinating part. So just, just a little background again for folks who didn't watch the documentary and are skeptical of sports ball. <laughs> Rodman, even if you don't know sports, you probably know who Rodman is because, you know, he was on the, the last three championship teams. He was just a weird dude, really built a brand. Of, he was one of the first people to make a brand around weirdness. And in the 1998 season, at one point, he decides he's going to take a 48 hour bender in Las Vegas and goes, mm-hmm. and just debauches himself in every way possible in Vegas in the middle of the season. Yeah. And before a finals game, the NBA finals game, he misses practice without telling anyone so he can be in a WWE wrestling event. It's like, yeah, yep. dude. But because he was such a valuable player, Jordan let it right. slide. And that was just, like you said, mate, it's hard to square all that together. Um, Luke, right. do you have any Rodman hot takes? I'm sure we all do. What are your Rodman takes and how that fits in with Jordan? What did you think of his wedding dress? That's the question. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I always thought Rodman was a really weird dude, and the documentary just kind of uh, made that more apparent to me, I would say. <laughs> that whole thing where he goes off to Vegas, he's like, I need 48 hours, I'm going to Vegas. And then it's like, I don't know, 96 hours have passed, and no one knows where he is. And Jordan yes. has to go knock on his hotel room door and drag him back to practice. And Rodman shows up to practice in pajama pants and flip-flops. Yep. That whole thing is just like, <laughs> I, I could not believe that. I mean. It kind yeah. of adds to the overall mythos of the Bulls, doesn't it? You have Michael Jordan, who, again, is like this perfect specimen of how all our aspirations for athletes. Then you have this weirdo cast of characters that includes like mm-hmm. the coach who's like talking all these Zen riddles and Rodman <laughs> doing all this. And it, it's, there's a reason this was compelling television. It's, it's just all time weird archetypes of people. But, yeah, absolutely. Right. So one final thing I wanted to talk about is this idea of the the generational divide. Because mm. uh, I spend a lot of time on sports Twitter. Luke, uh, you, you spend a lot of time in the sports world too, and it's, Mandy, it sounds like you do as well. One of the <laughs> evergreen topics of debate for literally like the last 10 years is who is the GOAT? And again, yeah. for those of you who aren't into sports, GOAT is an acronym for greatest of all time. Back when I was a kid, it basically was one of Muhammad Ali's nicknames. But now, mm-hmm. GOAT can be used in any context, just to mean the greatest of all time, and now the internet has made it an emoji, so you just use the GOAT emoji, and some of us, like me, use it far too often. I, I think I called Broncos rookie quarterback Drew Locke the GOAT in a text to you last year, Luke. I apologize. <laughs> um, yeah, I was, uh, I was thinking we might need to slow down. We might need to slow down on that one a little bit. I was, uh, I was, I was a little concerned. I was a little concerned at that point. <laughs> So the argument now is, who's the GOAT? Is it Jordan? Is it LeBron? And as you can imagine, a lot of it's broken down over generational lines. So Gen Z, or I guess they're called Zoomers now, they're all like, of course it's LeBron. He's bigger, he's stronger, he's more skilled. He played in today's game, which is better than the NBA of the 90s. Of course it's LeBron, duh. Whereas the old timers be like, ah, this generation's soft. Jordan's the GOAT. He has six rings. He never lost to finals. LeBron's soft. And, you know, then they just start screaming at each other. I am at this situation, and Luke, I, you're, you're in the same situation too, where I'm kind of straddling both generations because in a lot of ways, I'm sympathetic with LeBron fans because 
as a millennial, I take a lot of crap from, you know, boomer, from boomers who just yell at me. But I was a kid when Jordan was doing his thing. So I am drinking the Jordan Kool-Aid in terms of like the myth of Jordan. So I go back and forth, but I'm seeing these two groups yelling at, e at each other from afar. So let's, let's start with the big question. Luke, who's the goat? And what, what are your observations on the generational differences? Okay, since we're going to ask this question, first off, <laughs> I think it's a stupid, I think it's a stupid argument because there's no way to objectively decide who the yeah. best basketball player of all time is. So I think just the time people spend arguing over this is kind of stupid. But given that, I'll give you my thoughts on the whole thing. You know, as you know, we're old enough to have seen Jordan and LeBron both play. And if you wanted to tell me that LeBron was the best athlete ever to play basketball, I wouldn't argue with you. But I firmly believe that Michael Jordan is the best basketball player of all time. You know, I could talk for a long time about the reasons of why I believe that. But I just feel like Jordan had this mental edge over the whole competition and just that competitiveness. Like you said, he was 6-0 and in the finals. No one ever got him to a game seven. Another thing I look at is... Jordan really had no weaknesses in his game. I mean, he, he could, right. he was good at everything, you know, he needed, you know, people look at him as a shooter and a scorer, but I mean, he was a good rebounder for his size. He could handle the ball. He was a great passer. He was a great defensive player. And I look mm -hmm. at LeBron and I mean, he's never been a great shooter. There have been years in his career where he didn't shoot 70% from the free throw line. And it's mm -hmm. hard for me to say that someone's the best basketball player of all time if they struggle to shoot 70% from the free throw line. And, my dad will be really proud of me if he hears uh, if he listens to this. Um, I, I sounded just like something he would say there. And Matt knows my dad, so he's laughing right now. I can but, picture your dad like banging the table and like raising his glass to you. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. If he listens to that, he'll be he'll be really proud of me. But so I mean, again, that's just my opinion. And I think the generational divide. I, I feel like there's always going to be that divide. Like I said, we're old enough to have seen both of them play, so I think we have a different perspective. But you know, I think the younger generations, you know, they never actually saw Jordan play. So, you know, LeBron right. is the greatest player of their generation. So they assume, you know, since they haven't, you know, gotten that experience of seeing Jordan, it's like, oh, you know, of course LeBron's the best player. You know, he's the best player of this generation. And, you know, we never saw that. And I think that's one cool thing about The Last Dance and, you know, it coming out when it did is it gives, you know, those younger generations, those youngsters, it gives them a chance to uh, <laughs> actually see how good Jordan was and how good those Bulls teams of the 90s were. And uh, I, so, you know, like I said, I go to school with a bunch of people who are about 10 years younger than me. And so I think them getting to see that since, you know, they never actually got to see Jordan play. And I don't, I don't consider Jordan playing with the Wizards. I, I pretend that never happened. Like, I, <laughs> oh, yes, we all do. I, yeah, I, I, um, <laughs> don't, I don't acknowledge that at all. So, right. yeah, but I think, you know, those younger generations getting to actually see, you know, the highlights of Jordan and how good he actually was. You know, I think that's mm -hmm. pretty cool. But I think there's always going to be that generational divide of this generation thinks, you know, whatever they have is the best. And, you know, right. so I think that's, you know, can be part of that. Th those are my thoughts on that anyway. All right, Mandy, your thoughts. Do you want yeah, to settle I, the GOAT go, debate? Or, and what, what, do you, what can you say about <laughs> the generational no, I, infighting? Right. No, I really do. I agree with Luke. I was thinking about that before. About I just think people want ownership of their people, and they want to witness it. And so, of course, the people who are too young to remember Jordan are going to think it's LeBron because he's a standout. You know, he takes teams to finals. and. I love it when they lose. Um, but, um, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Um, I, but yeah, like all this, stat, the stats to me, if you're looking at numbers, Jordan was better. Now, of course, the argument, like you guys said, is, oh, well, they, the teams weren't as good, but I think it really is just the generation wants to be the owner. They want ownership of whoever that goat is. And so I think that's what the, the argument is back and forth. But and I had the exact same thought with Last Dance. I'm like, I hope lots of those youngsters watch this and just see because even just the beauty in his play, his technical skill is ridiculous. I mean, Air Jordan, hi, that was it was called that for a reason. It was unreal watching him jump. So I hope there's a little more appreciation. I don't think it'll be settled because back to the ownership thing, they want it to be their guy. They want it to be LeBron because they know him and they've followed his career in real time. So those are my thoughts. I'm trying to be nice. 
<laughs> oh, Mandy, you know you don't have to be nice around here. The interest I know, but that's, you're that's, a really, I hater. that's about that's about all I'm. That's what I think. I think I've made it pretty clear who I think the goat is, and I'm mad about it because he beat my magic. But you know, it's okay. <laughs> so I'm over so it now. I'm okay. So this is a question I have spent far too long thinking about because, like you said, Luke, it's it's unknowable. We can never know. It's basically just something to talk about. We we, we can never have a definitive answer. But I feel like there's, there's almost two different questions within this. There's who is the best basketball player to ever live? And then who's the GOAT? Because it sounds like they're the same question, but they're really different when you hear the way people talk about it. You know, like you, you hear people like like you mentioned this, Luke, like his ment- Jordan's mental edge. Or, you know, the, going six and oh in the finals, or you know, he was he was the all time winner, he was a killer, which goes to the mythos of Jordan, but does that really mean he's a better basketball player? So when we're talking about who's the GOAT in terms of, you know, how they're in the culture, how we view them, their their sort of legendary status within the game, it's obviously Jordan. If we're talking about who's better at the game of basketball, that is a very close question. I spent a lot of time reading nerd NBA sites, breaking down all the advanced stats. It's actually <laughs> very close. It's the best basketball player ever. I think it's Obviously, either Jordan or LeBron. I'm not sure which one. It depends on what mood I'm in. But it's it's very close. <laughs> but that kind of reveals a lot of interesting things about us, right? Because, Luke, you, you brought up, uh, you know, the younger generation always wants their... They, we just assume that, oh, whatever's going on now is the best it's ever been. That's absolutely mm-hmm. true. But there's this also thing, like, when you reach a certain age, you're like, ah, things are better in my time. Kids these days <laughs> have it easy. And that, that's just something that's ingrained in all of us our human psyche. You can see both of these coming out on either side of the debate. Like there's one, Luke, uh, forgive me in advance, but Patrick <laughs> Mahomes has been driving me crazy recently. Um, oh. <laughs> so, um, so Patrick, I want to hear this is the quarter for those, again, for those of you who don't know sports, he is the quarterback for the Kansas city chiefs. He recently won an NFL MVP, won a super bowl this year. He's objectively awesome. He's a great quarterback. Chiefs are a rival of my beloved Denver Broncos. My father-in-law is a Chiefs fan. He has not let me forget any of this. And I respect Patrick Mahomes' talent immensely. I also can't stand any of it because he's the Chiefs. So my guy is forever and always John Elway, who I maintain is the greatest quarterback of all time, and I cannot be dissuaded from it who led my Broncos to two Super Bowls, also won an NFL MVP, whatever. But the argument I will hear from Chiefs fans is like, well, Patrick Mahomes is the most talented quarterback ever. Look at the throws he's doing. No one else in NFL history could do it. And I, and I get on my soapbox and say, no, I've watched the tape, young buck. I've watched YouTube videos of John Elway. He did all that same stuff. He was every bit as talented as Patrick Mahomes, if not more so. You're just saying that because Patrick Mahomes is the guy now and Elway's old. Don't overlook Elway because he's older. And then I step off my soapbox like, wow, I need to care about more important things. But it's sort of <laughs> it's those things where, on the one hand, you can see the young people like, well, obviously, NFL's probably better than it's ever been. He's putting up numbers no one else has, so obviously he's the best. Whereas all of us old-timers like, well, the game was different. Elway did the right. same stuff. You actually didn't even look at the tape. I did. So sit down, <laughs> and you can see how it can get toxic either way, even though it's something that objectively is unknowable and doesn't matter. Luke, <laughs> you should drag me off the soapbox by saying something to get me off. Yeah, yeah I, think off the soapbox. <laughs> I think you should tell us how uh, why Tom Brady's so overrated, Matt. <laughs> oh, yeah, I want to hear that. Tell us your well, feelings. Well, that's probably a good... Well, I'm not sure if it's a good idea, but I'll do it anyway. So, Brady, <laughs> he's portrayed as the ultimate winner, right? He has six Super Bowl rings. Okay, great. But here's the other thing. His coach is undisputably the greatest coach ever to live, Bill Belichick. Also, the greatest GM ever. And he always had teams loaded with talent, so of course he's going to win. So here's what right. I would say. If Brady's the best, then let's swap careers. Let's put Peyton Manning on the Patriots his whole career. Peyton's probably won eight Super Bowls. And what if Brady oh, yeah. had to struggle through those awful Colts teams that Peyton did? He's probably out oh, in two yeah. years. That's my hot right. take. If any Boston sports fans are out there, come at me. 
That makes me think of Barry Sanders, who would have been an, he was an incredible athlete, but he didn't have the offensive line. And so he couldn't put up the numbers. So I a hundred percent agree with you. Tom Brady is way and, overrated. And coming so. back to the whole mythos thing, Tom Brady, he has the mythos, right? Because yeah. you know, he's a winner. He's handsome. He's not really cool, but he's handsome. He's married to no. a supermodel. I don't even think he's handsome. I have to argue there. I don't find him no. handsome, but it's probably because I don't like him. Agree so. to disagree on that one, Mandy, but it is so <laughs> the important okay. narrative <laughs> how the, the story can take hold in our imaginations, even if, you know, yeah. nerds like me will come up with our stats. Do you think a Boston sports fan cares about any of my stats or my hypotheticals? No, they know the narrative. They know Brady's the goat because of their narrative. It's right. narrative. It's everywhere, people. It's everywhere. So even if you're not a sports ball fan, look for the narrative. Yeah. It's fascinating. Well, I okay. think that's what sports are. They're dramas. I mean, when I have drama friends, people who like to go to plays that don't like sports, and I'm like, it's a whole, every game is a story, and every career is a story. Yep, absolutely. That's why we do it, right? We we watch. Yeah, sports, that's totally why know, we like, watch sports. Like. <laughs> I enjoy the I enjoy the stats. I enjoy just the beauty of watching people be awesome at something. But also, it's it's the narrative. We all get our little chosen narratives, and we all foist our narrative on people with other narratives, and then take differences personally. Yeah. Well, I told you when I had a fantasy football team, I only drafted guys that I thought were nice people, and then I actually ended up winning the season, and I was the only woman. My team was the Mama's Boys. I, That's what I, I called th them. I think our moms were going to do that one time. I vaguely remember them uh, talking about doing that and drafting a fantasy football team of guys who were just nice guys. Nice, like, good-looking yeah. young men. Yeah. <laughs> good uh, Christian boys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I think so that it's, was it's the, Basically, uh, our moms just <laughs> would try to field a team of 12 Tim Tebows if they could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Well, let, let's not go let's there. Let's not start let's on just, that. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> All right. Well, we have actually gone over time because we've, I mean, once we're talking it, I mean, you guys keep getting, getting me on the soapbox. So how can I not talk about Tom Brady for the next 20 minutes? But thank you right. all. Thank you both very much. Really appreciate you coming on. And folks, thank you. I would, I would encourage yeah, you, thanks. even if you don't care at all about sports, give Last Dance a try. It's, it's going to be streaming on Netflix soon. Fascinating human stories that go beyond sports and. Once again, things are winding down at the Anselm Digital Pub. Fire's down to embers. The customers are trundling home. And you've promised your brother that you're going to challenge him an NBA jam before bed. Once again, Believe to See is a podcast of the Anselm Society. To find out more about the Anselm Society, visit us at anselmsociety.org. And thank you all for joining. Take it easy. We'll see you next time.